most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our sin bearer, to be our substitute, to receive the wrath of God in his own body for us. We thank you, for Lord, for that message of the cross. It's the power of God and salvation. We thank you for that victorious proclamation and the shout and the cry, it is finished. Paid in full. We thank you so much that our sin debt has been removed, paid in full, for those of us who believe the good news. And truly, this is good news of the death and then the victorious resurrection of the Savior. We celebrate, Father, that victory over death. And we know that we will live forever because of that event. That event that broke the power of death. And we thank you, Lord, for the ongoing life we can live. The abundant life for us as believers. As we take in the word of God by faith. So, Father, I pray today as we celebrate the resurrection of the Savior, we might receive with humility the engrafted Word of God, which is able to save our souls from the power of sin. Sanctify us through your truth, because your Word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to the resurrection chapter. And you may ask, what chapter is that? <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, this chapter, we're going to try to go through all 58 verses in one message. And I know it is possible. We'll see how far we get. But uh, we're going to move pretty quickly. But I just want to outline some of the major things in this uh, chapter great chapter on the resurrection we begin here with verse 1 moreover brethren I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you which you also received and in which you stand notice he's addressing believers the believers here at Corinth Paul declared the gospel during his missionary journey to the Corinthian believers the good news about Christ's death and resurrection and they believed as a matter of fact verse 11 says Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. They believed that message. So what is receiving the message? Receiving the message in verse 1 is believing. And that's exactly what John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become sons of God, even to those who do what? Believe on his name. The gospel means good news. Good news. Paul in the past proclaimed to you, we have here the uh, aorist tense. Uh, he declared in the past, aorist, uh, we have present here, uh, tense there, but aorist tense, he preached, and then they received it, aorist tense. But notice the word in which you stand. Stand there is a perfect tense. Perfect tense means action that begun in the past with ongoing results on into the present. They stand by grace through that gospel. Now, I think this is similar to what Paul said in Romans chapter 5. That we're justified by grace, but we are not only are justified by grace, we stand in grace. They continue to stand because of that gospel. Now, verse 2 says, by which you are all but by which you are saved. Here we have a present tense. But he says, if you hold fast a word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Now, some people look at that saying, well, I've got to continually believe in order to be saved, or they think born again. He's not saying that. Now, remember, salvation can have various tenses, three tenses we think of. Salvation from sin's penalty, Ephesians 2, 8. But here I think it's salvation from sin's power. This is what's called progressive sanctification. And then there's ultimate salvation, salvation from the very presence of sin. He's saying that that gospel message that you accepted has a sanctifying effect. If you continue to hold to that truth of Christ's death and resurrection, and so that gospel can have a powerful purifying effect 
unless they defect from the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith and the bodily resurrection of Christ, which they were being taught by false teachers, there's no resurrection. Now what does believing in vain? Believing in vain is not a head faith versus a heart faith type of thing. Later on he tells us that if Christ is not um, risen, their faith is empty in verse 14. If Christ is not risen and our preaching is empty, your faith is empty. Notice. And in verse 17 says, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. <clears throat> so the idea is that there's, uh, if you believe in vain, meaning that if there is no resurrection, then the object of your faith is false. <clears throat> and so he assumes that the resurrection is true. See? Now, verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Notice, Paul received this message of the gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ. This was revealed to him. And the core of the gospel is in the following two verses. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's a pretty simple message. But notice the word for. What does it mean Christ died for our sins? Well, it shows you the reason why he died. Some people say that he died just to show us how to live, the example theory of the atonement. Uh, but here it means he died as our substitute. That word hooper, H-U-P-E-R, is a Greek preposition. And it means in our place as our substitute. So what we're teaching here is substitutionary atonement or substitutionary death. He died in our stead. He died the just for the unjust. We deserve condemnation. We deserve death. But on the cross, Christ took our place. He became our sin bearer, as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We call that the great exchange. Our sins were placed on Christ, and when we believe, he gives us his righteousness. What a deal. That's a great thing, isn't it? So he died for our sins. And so he became a sin bearer. That's why he came. And this is based on the prophecies of the Old Testament. And there are several Old Testament scriptures that indicated that Christ would die. We'll only name a few of them. Isaiah chapter 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Notice that. It's for our sins. And then Isaiah 53 verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, God the Father laid on his son, the iniquity of us all. That's imputation. He imputed our sins to the Savior. Isaiah 53, 8, just at the end. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. For the sins of my people was he stricken. The transgressions. And then at the end of chapter 53, verse 11, for he shall bear their iniquities. He shall bear their iniquities. In Isaiah 53, 12, at the end, he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. So the scriptures predicted that Messiah would be a sin bearer. He would come to bear the sin, pay for the sins of all, actually, the whole world, as John 3.16 indicates. So he died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, verse 4, in that he was buried. Now, his burial demonstrated that he died. This was not the swoon theory of atonement, as some teach, that, well, he swooned on the cross, and then, kind of like when he got into the tomb, he woke up. And so they try to attack the doctrine of resurrection, saying Christ merely swooned. No, he had his side pierced. <laughs> and blood and water came out in that order, showing that this was a death. Medical proof that he died. Uh, he was dead. And uh, so Isaiah 53, verse 9 says, They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. He was buried in the rich man's tomb. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. 
And then we have the resurrection. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And there are such passages, such as Psalm 16, 10, and 11. For you not, will not leave my soul in Sheol. That's the uh, place where the spirit goes at death. He said, you will not leave my soul in Sheol. And then the body is pictured as going to the grave, but that body did not decay. You nor you will allow your holy one to see corruption. Isn't that interesting? That body did not suffer decay. Remember Lazarus the resurrection? He said, you know, it's three days, he's it's fourth day now. He started to decay. Three days he was only in the grave. His body did not see corruption. Uh, you will show me the path of life in the presence of this fullness of joy. And as your right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10 and 11. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put in the grief. When you made his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. How will he do that? How can a dead man do that? Through resurrection. He shall prolong his days. So the scriptures predicted his resurrection. Now we have the witnesses who saw the Savior alive after he arose. And then we have here actually uh, five accounts out of 17. Now if you look at your handout, there were 17 resurrection appearances of Christ. Now this is broken into several categories by the way. The first five events occurred on the day of resurrection. So events one through five occurred on the day of the resurrection. And then the following six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, occurred up to his ascension. Christ was here on the earth for 40 days. So at least six other occurrences beyond the day of resurrection where he appeared to various individuals. And then after his ascension back to heaven, he appeared in the book of Acts. There's six more occurrences uh, to Stephen, Saul, who later became Paul, and then finally the apostle John Christ appeared to. So there's a total of 17 post-resurrection appearances. Five of them are mentioned here in the book of 1 Corinthians 15. We see that number three, I have it outlined, you have an underline there. He appeared first of all to Peter, 1 Corinthians 15a. And then number five, uh, he appeared here to the 12. He calls it the 12 here, which by the way, the 12 is simply a number showing that these are the original apostles that he called. Doesn't mean that there were actual 12 by that time. The number was reduced. Remember, Judas betrayed Christ. Uh, and then Thomas wasn't there in the first appearance. But the 12 is really a group title so that we identify them as the apostles. So he appeared to the 12. So in, in our uh, passage here in 1 Corinthians 15, um, verse 5, he was seen by Peter, then by the 12. Now, some may ask, well, why, why don't we have the appearances to Mary or Mary Magdalene? Well, uh, in court, uh, women were not allowed to witness or their, their witness was not valid in a courtroom setting. So I think Paul is presenting legal evidence for the resurrection. And in that day, that they, they did not allow women to uh, present legal evidence in court. So this is the reason why he mentioned men in this passage. Um, mentioning Peter first. Now, verse 6, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Now this is probably the most astounding validation of the resurrection of the Savior. Notice he says, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Some have died by this time, but the majority is still alive, meaning you can go interview them. Now, usually when you see some cult or religious movement, an angel appeared to me in my bedroom privately. Well, how do you validate that? You only have the one individual that you can ask. You know, or maybe I'll say, my friend witnessed it. Well, he's kind of biased. But when you say that 
in public, Christ appeared over 500 at once, and you can go interview them. I think this is one of the strongest proofs of the, of the evidence of the resurrection of Christ. Why would you say such a thing if you tried to cover up the secret of resurrection? Why would you say that? So that's a very strong proof. And then you could go even the idea, even there are several that have died already, but there's still a lot out there you can interview. Um, then he says here, uh, and that, by the way, is in your handout, number eight. Number eight. And then he appears to James. And by the way, some people think that his half-brother James became a believer at this point. Remember James wrote the gospel, the, wrote the book of James. This is James, the half-brother of the Lord. Early in the gospels, it says his brothers, half-brothers, did not believe him. What changed? I think it was his appearance, the resurrection. And so I think James could have become a believer at this point and later on wrote the book of James. And then all the apostles. Now, there are several occurrences where he appeared to the apostles, but I think this is probably referring to his ascension to the 11, the verse number 11, by the way, on your handout. He appeared to the 11 disciples at his ascension. And then finally, he says in verse 8, Then last of all, he was seen by me, the Apostle Paul, as one born out of due time. Now, that's a very interesting word in the Greek. I did some studying on that this week. and It could mean, one of, it could mean several things, but one, he could be saying that I was born beyond the normal time of giving birth, meaning that if a woman is pregnant, she goes beyond the nine, nine months. You know, sometimes there's complications, but I was born out of time. Saying that really, I did not grow up and live and, and saw Christ when he ministered to the 12. I can't, I'm Johnny come lately, we could say. I'm Johnny come lately. Or this idea means either a late term birth or an early birth. I was like a miscarriage, you know. And it's, I'm like a spiritually dead man that Christ you know, rose from the, delivered from death. And there could be an allusion to the fact that, you know, Paul was, you know, made fun of, and he's called little, by the way, and so he's like a, like a small child that's miscarried, because that's what his attackers were saying. But yet, in spite of that, God used me. In spite of that, God used me. So either way, he says, I'm one like born out of due time. Now, he calls himself the least of all the apostles, and to us, that's really thinking Paul the least. We think Paul's the greatest. But uh, Paul here, expressing humility, he says, think about who I was before I came to faith in Christ. He says, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He murdered Christians. And by the way, this is yet another strong evidence of the reality of the resurrection. What would change a man that persecuted the church that murdered Christians, and now he preaches the faith he once destroyed. What would so transform his life for the rest of his life that he would be beaten, stoned, put in jail, and still proclaim that truth? The resurrection of the Savior. That is what transformed Paul. And you remember on the road to Damascus, the Lord appeared to Paul, and he was forever transformed by that point onward. Notice he says, by God's grace, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And you know what? All of us could say the same thing. We don't deserve anything that God has given us, especially salvation. We are undeserved. We are undeserved, undeserving creatures. But it's by the God's grace, I am what I am. But you know what? That grace was not in vain to no purpose. I labored more abundantly than they all, all the other apostles. We can say that is true. Paul was... Uh, tireless in his missionary journeys. But yet he says, it's not my strength alone, it's the grace of God which was with me, meaning God's divine enablement. We are saved by grace, we are enabled by grace to serve him, and we grow in God's grace. It's all of God's grace. Therefore, whether it was I the uh, or they, the original apostles, we preach the same message and so you Corinthians believe that message, the gospel. Now, uh, verse 12, he, he uh, brings out a question, well, what if there, as some are teaching, no resurrection? 
what are the implications? Think about this. And I think atheists should consider this too, but many of them have, but the answer is dark when you think about it. Now, Christ is preaching he has been risen from the dead. How are there some among you that say, there's no resurrection of the dead? He said, verse 13, well, if there's no resurrection, then Christ is not risen. <laughs> and what's the implication of that? Verse 14, and if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. We have a Greek word, kenos, means it's aimless, meaningless. You know, our faith is meaningless if it's not rooted in the historical fact of Christ's death and resurrection. We cannot reject that historical fact without destroying the meaning of our faith. Might as well throw everything away and go home. But he says, if that is not true, if there's no resurrection, our faith is meaningless. It's empty. And yes, we're found false witnesses of God. Why? Because Paul says, we've seen the Savior. The apostles and Paul. We've seen the Savior. If that's not true, then we're a liar. We're false witnesses. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up at the fact that the dead did not rise. He said, you know, you're calling us a liar if this is not true. We saw the Savior. Now, verse 17, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. Now, he said earlier, his faith is empty. This Greek word here means to no purpose. Some translate it fruitless. Our faith is fruitless. And therefore, you're still in your sins. You know, if you don't have a sin bearer, you're still guilty. You're in your sins and you'll die condemned. Think about that. Then also, what about those who have already died in Christ? You know, your loved ones who are believers? Remember Paul mentions this, that he's going to bring these ones that is coming with him in the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Meaning that's the end of them. No afterlife, that's it. They're gone. You know, and you know, I've told this to individuals before. I said, you know, if that person's an unbeliever whom you're thinking about marrying, think about this. If they don't become a believer, you'll never see them again. When they once they die, you have no hope of seeing them again. But here the idea is those who were believers, you're never going to see them again. If life is all there is, that's it, then there's no point. And that's what he summarizes in verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. We're to be pitied. This word means being deserving of sympathy for one's pathetic condition. It's interesting that the atheist looks at the Christian and says, I pity you for believing that hokey story. You know, it's the opposite. I pity you for thinking that this is all that life there is to life. You live, you grow old, you die. You may even die young. And that's it. You cease to be. I pity you. We have the truth on our side. We have the truth on our side. And so if you think there's no resurrection, I pity you. Now, chapter uh, 15, verse 20 through 28, uh, speaks about the implications of the resurrection. Christ rose from the dead, that means that guarantees our resurrection. For now Christ has risen from the dead. Now he's something, but you know what? If this was true, you know, we're, if this wasn't true, then this is the result. But now he affirms Christ is risen from the dead. Verse 20. He's become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, he could be alluding to the Feast of First Fruits. Remember where the grain harvest was weighed before the Lord, the priest would wave the grain harvest before the Lord, the Feast of First Fruits. And by the way, it's interesting that in Leviticus 23:11, that first fruit feast occurred on the day after the Sabbath. Think about when Christ rose from the dead, Matthew 28, 1 on the day after the Sabbath. Perfect typology. Perfect typology for the Passover lamb when he died, Passover lamb. We had the next day, day of unleavened bread, when he was in the grave, and then the third day, on the third day, 
we have this feast of first fruits, and that's the day that Christ rose from the dead, the day after the Sabbath. It fits perfectly. And also the feast of first fruits, uh, the crop, the first fruits of the crop was dedicated to the Lord in the sense of they're thanking God for that. It was a guarantee of future blessing of the full crop. And so the idea is when Christ rose from the dead, he guarantees all the other believers who will be raised from the dead. He's only the beginning. His resurrection is only the first group. And when we think of group, actually there were those who on Christ's resurrection day who rose in the city of Jerusalem, who came back to life. So the whole cluster there is the first fruits guaranteeing our future resurrection. It's only the beginning. Here are the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Remember, I said the word fallen asleep is only picturing believers' death. And even death itself for the believer is simply like cold closing your eyes, going to sleep, and waking up in heaven. It's a beautiful thing. Think about that. We don't have to fear death if we're a believer. Now, verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Now, what man was that? Well, verse 22 tells us, Adam. As in Adam all die. So, because of one man, that's why we have death. Think about, you know, you think about the virus and all that, people are dying. Adam. Adam rebelled against God. That's why we have sickness, illness, and death. Romans 5.12 says, Death passed upon all men for all sin in Adam. And so, that obituary called Genesis 5, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, was a result of the fall because of Adam. In Adam, he almost pictures even race connected to Adam. You're either in one of two people. You're either in Adam, connected to him, receiving death, or you're in Christ, receiving life. Two positions here in great contrast. In Adam I'll die, but so even so in Christ, shall all be made alive. I think this is resurrection life in our union with Christ. But each one in his own order. Word all order, Greek word togma means group of soldiers, units. It's like a unit that marches together. There's a group, this group and that group. Each one in his own resurrection group. See, Christ the first fruits, there's one group. And then afterward, those who are Christ and his coming. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he has put down an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Now you can look at your little chart here. Now there are some all-millennial teachers that try to use this to say that, well, the end of human history occurs when Christ returns. But wait a second. There is this little uh, word in the Greek, then which allows for a period of time between events. For instance, between Christ's first fruits and those that are Christ's that is coming, we have right now almost 2,000 years. That's a long period of time. So he's, he's looking at the broad picture. He's not trying to get every detail here, but he's looking at the panorama of these events. And so we can also say that between the then those are Christ's coming, then the end, there's also a period of time. It doesn't mean that the end occurs at Christ's coming. See, this is how all mills try to teach uh, attack pre-mill. They like to use this passage. But that's why I'm laid out for you. But before that end, what do we have? Before the, the second ending, when God will destroy death, that's the ultimate goal, the destruction of death, we have... The Lord reigning till all enemies are put under his feet. And in your chart, that's the millennial kingdom. That occurs between the second coming and the end. So he says something occurs before the end. He will reign till he's put every enemy under his feet. But the last enemy is what? Death. And when we look at when death will be defeated, let's take a look at Revelation 22, verses or 21 verse 4, Revelation 21 verse 4. 
And we will see the end of death in this passage. And uh, here, the Apostle John records the end of death, chapter 21, verse 4. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, right there, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When is this? This is the eternal state. It's the eternity I have on the chart there. That's when death will be defeated. By the way, the reign of Christ continues because in chapter 22, verse 1 and 3, we have two thrones we have that are shared, the throne of God and the Lamb. Both the Lord and Christ co-rules. So what is, this is saying here in uh, 1 Corinthians, he's saying that Christ will reign until he put every outer enemy under his feet, then he hands the kingdom back to the Father. I will accomplish your purpose. And then they continue to reign forever. So he accomplishes the purpose that the Father sent him in regard to rulership. And then he hands the kingdom back to him. So, verse 27, For he had put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he put all that he who put all things under him is accepted, meaning that all things do not include God. Obviously, God's not included in everything put under his feet. He wanted to make that clear. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will be subject to him and put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And basically, that's Revelation 22, 1 and 3. He hands a kingdom back to the Father, and then they continue to reign forever. So, uh, Hebrews chapter two verse five: the angels, the the angels are not given the age to come. But you know what? We don't see Jesus yet defeating all enemies. It's interesting, Hebrews chapter two, which shows that the kingdom is not now. By the way. And uh, let's just briefly look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, and then we'll look at um, verse 5 and following. For he hath not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels. That's the coming kingdom. Uh, no, the Son will reign in that kingdom not angels. But one testified in a certain place saying, what is man you're mindful of the son of man you take care of him? He's quoting Psalm 8. You've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned with glory and honor. You've set him over the work of their hands. You put all things in subjection under his feet. Notice here, verse 8, for him that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we do not yet see all things put under him but we see Jesus. The kingdom is not now, but he'll reign in the kingdom and eventually everything will be put under his authority, including finally death. He'll defeat every last enemy, including Satan. Satan will be bound during the kingdom, by the way. And uh, so we'll have victory even over angels. So this ta actually this passage teaches premillennial doctrine. Okay, let's now look at uh, verse 29. Now we come to a difficult passage which I think cults have used to practice, and even the Roman Catholic Church, by the way, uses this falsely. Uh, otherwise, what will they do for those who are baptized for the dead? So they think, well, is it baptism only for the living? What about this strange pa uh, practice of baptism for the dead? What is he talking about there? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? He may have been using this false practice for argument's sake. If there are those who are baptizing other individuals to provide salvation for their dead loved ones, why do that if there's no resurrection? He could be throwing out a hypothetical. Um, he doesn't commend this practice, by the way. 
And this is what cults do. They take obscure verses, unclear verses, and make major doctrine out of them. That's false hermeneutics. We need to take the clear verses that are in Scripture and uh, make sure the doctrine is formulated from those passages, not the obscure passages. Now, another thing he might be referring to is there are believers who are, who are dying for the faith, and then, just like replacement soldiers, the next one would be baptized instead of the other one, in the sense that that was replenishing the ranks. There, there's more soldiers coming on for the Lord. Those who are dying off, the ones who are baptized, who are new believers, they're really taking the place of those who have died in the past. So it's another possible interpretation. Paul may also refer to the fact that the baptism of new converts is replenishing the depleted ranks of believers who have died. If so, his sense here would be, why do you continue to fill the church with baptized converts who replace those who have died if you really believe there's only hope for them, if there is any, there, you really believe there is any hope for them beyond the grave? Meaning if you don't believe in an afterlife, why replenish the ranks? Okay. Another reason why the resurrection is true, Paul says, why am I risking my neck every hour? <laughs> you know, I'm going through all the world, preaching the gospel, going in many places that are very dangerous to be, dangerous places to be. I'm risking my neck. If the resurrection is not true, why waste energy and effort? If I'm, I should really try to preserve my life because that's all there is. Why do I sit in jeopardy every hour? Now look at the following verse. I affirm my boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. I think this is in the physical sense, with the con in the context. I'm risking my life every day for the service of Christ. I'm risking my life. Why do that? Why go in the areas where it's da you're in danger of losing your life if this life is all there is. I wouldn't want to try to hold on as much as I can, as long as I can to this life. And unfortunately, this is a sad truth of many believers. They're fearful. They're trying to hold on as much as they can to this life instead of realizing that even if they take our life, there's billions and billions of years to live in heaven in glory for the believer. Now, you might as well be like the Epicureans. Only pursue pleasure now. Look at verse 32. If in the manner of man I follow beast at Ephesus. Now, are these literal wild animals? It's possible. Although it wasn't really at this point that they started to put Christians in Roman Colosseums. That came in lions. You know, practice of Christians are placed to be sport uh, in a Colosseum uh, and lions would attack them. I think that's later church history. It occurred later. It could be possible that wasn't the practice here early on. He could refer to men described as wild beasts. Wild beasts can refer to demon-possessed men. Uh, certain pastors such as Titus 1.12, uh, the Cretans are called wild beasts, for instance. So he says, you know, I'm fighting with beasts at Ephesus, these demon-possessed people. What advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? You might as well be like the Epicureans. Let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. You might as well live life to its fullest, you know, grab all the gusto you can because once you die, it's all over. That's it. Uh, this false teaching, though, was, was destroying believers and, and destroying their incentive for living a godly life. And that's what the following verses are, about, all, are all about. Verse 33, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now, he could refer to evil people, which is true, or an evil message. We actually have the Greek word uh, homilia. We get the word homily from this word. And it means to converse or talk. So I think this is the message. Bad or worthless doctrine ruins the useful or habitual spiritual life. Bad doctrine corrupts your Christian walk. It has a negative effect. 
So the bad doctrine, there's no resurrection, well, I might as well live life to its fullest. I might as well just pursue pleasures for myself. Forget about other people. Why would I waste my time ministering to them? It's all about me, myself, and I. And this is corruptive. So bad doctrine has a negative effect upon your, your walk with the Lord. That's why he said in verse 34, wake to righteousness. Wake up, believers. You're being deluded by this false doctrine that there's no resurrection. Awake to righteousness. Do not sin. So some do not have the knowledge of God. These false teachers. I speak this to your shame in the sense that you're allowing these people to teach. Shameful. They're not aware. They don't have the same standards as we do as believers. They don't have the same values. They don't have the same beliefs, you know, as we do. Now, somebody come along, well then, you know, dead bodies that are decayed and how in the world does a body come to life? That's absurd. And Paul deals with that in verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And what, what kind of body do they come? How is that possible? You know, that body is decayed and dead. Well, I would say, first of all, if you believe that God created the world out of nothing, then it's not hard to raise a body from the dead, right? And give life. When God originally gave life to Adam, that's why I think the arguments, he, he originally gave life, and it's not hard for God to raise one from the dead. Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive until it dies. Now, he uses the example of a seed. And from our viewpoint, a seed pictures death and resurrection. A seed is put into the ground, and it's no longer in view, in that ground. And then all of a sudden, life sprouts through the earth. And he's using that simply as a simple illustration. Remember, Jesus used simple things from nature to explain spiritual truths. And so Paul's doing the same thing here. You know, when you plant a seed... You expect life to come from that seed. We expect that. And so, you know, we see this in nature. Um, verse 30, 36, Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive until it dies, it decays. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. You have that wheat seed, it becomes wheat. Whatever grain becomes that grain. There may be a subtle hit at the nature of the body. There's continuity between our body now and the resurrection body. There's some continuity, meaning that, yes, it's totally transformed. Obviously, it's totally different in one sense. It's glorified. But Jesus said, you know, I still have the nail prints in my hand. It's a body. It's not a ghost. That's heresy, by the way. Uh, there was this man named Harris that Long Geiser wrote against who was denying a physical bodily resurrection. Christ rose physically, it was a body. It's called a body. Um, but a body that you can see the nail prints and, the, and even told Peter, you know, or uh, Thomas, you know, touch my side, you know. But yeah, a body could appear in a room, go through walls, eat food. What a miraculous thing, you know. And I think if we wanna know what the resurrection body is like for us, we just see Christ modeled his body for 40 days. And we'll get kind of a hint of what our body would be like. Uh, it, it's a supernatural body. So there might be some continuity here with the seed analogy between the our old body and, and our, our one to come. Now, all flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another fish, another birds, which, by the way, refutes evolution. Uh, there's different species or kinds. They're all not the same. They're not the same kind of flesh. There's different types of flesh among creation. And then there's a distinction between heavenly and earthly bodies. And I think he was trying to make me draw out the, the distinction between the bodies we have now, which are earthly, earthbound, and the body that we'll have in eternity, which is heavenbound. And so he says, there's bodies in the sky. We have celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. 
You're in a certain dignity or to our human body. It's created God's image. It has purpose and value, but how much more dignified our glorified body? Just like a bright shining star, like the sun, moon, you know. It, uh, it's much more glorious, we could say. Even among the stars, there's varying degrees of glory. Not every star is the same magnitude. We use the word magnitude. That determines, that's a value placed on its brightness. How bright is it? And this may be a hint of our resurrection bodies as well. There's one glory of the sun, sun obviously much brighter than the moon, another magnitude of the moon, another glory of a star, and even one star difference in magnitude. Even the stars vary in their brightness. Okay? Notice verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now, I'm not going to be 100% dogmatic here, but I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm leaning toward the idea that, and we have other clues in Scripture, Daniel 12, those that win souls to the Lord will shine as the stars of heaven in brightness. I think our glorified bodies will be distinct. Each person's body, one body will be brighter than another. And this will maybe one way throughout eternity to show rank. You know, how we show various ranks today. Our bodies will be glorified in light to our faithful service here on earth. And some Christians who have not done much for Christ will be dim, dim bulbs. <laughs> and others will shine bright. And others will be bright, bright shine. So even our resurrection bodies, there may be some distinctions among believers in the terrestrial realm, in our resurrection. And this is based on reward, although that is a possibility. Uh, so is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in corruption. Now, he has several contrasts now between the current body and the one to come. He lays those distinctions. He compares the two. Um, the body now is a corruptible body. It, it's decaying. Even Paul says the outward man is perishing. But the inward man can be renewed day by day. Isn't that wonderful? The older you grow, yes, you're feeling the pains, you're feeling the you know, tiredness and weakness. But you know what? The inward man can be just like a young child. You ever had those days where even the scripture, you're just like, wow, you feel like a brand new baby the joy and the peace that could be in your soul. That inward man can be renewed daily up to the day of death. Up to the day of the death of this physical body. You may not feel well outwardly, but inwardly it can be transformed. So he says here, um, the body of some corruption is raised incorruptible, meaning not subject to decay. The body now is some dishonor. <laughs> But then, you know what? It's going to be glorified, raised in glory. The body's now weak. It's sown in weakness. But you know what? It's going to be raised in power. Powerful body. Um, the body is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now, what does he mean there? Now, the natural body is the word sukikos. It means soulish. A body governed by the soul or fallen nature of man. You know, our body is under the control of the sin nature. It's dominated by that. But you know what? When we receive a resurrected body, we will say, goodbye, sin nature, controlling my body. We will have a supernatural body. Now, the word spiritual does not mean immaterial. It's very important. It doesn't mean you'll be like a ghost. Is like a vapor. No, it will be a material body, but it will be glorified. Okay? The word spiritual, we can translate supernatural. You have this natural body, this body resurrected will be supernatural. It will be dominated by the spirit. So a resurrected body will be not dominated by the flesh. It will be dominated by the spirit. It's a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is also a spiritual body. So a spiritual body denotes an immortal body, not an immaterial body. A spiritual body is one dominated by the spirit, not one devoid of matter. 
The Greek word pneumatikos, translated spiritual, means a body directed by the spirit as opposed to one under the domination, dominion of the flesh. Verse 45, as it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Adam was a life receiver. Remember? God breathed into man's nostril the breath of life. Adam was a receiver of life. What about the second Adam? Christ is a life giver. That shows he has life in himself. He's God. We're but mere mortals right now. But you know what? Our Lord Jesus Christ gives life. That's why we need to trust him. I cannot give you life, but he can. He is a life giver, whereas Adam was a life receiver. However, the, the verse 46, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Meaning, Adam was created bodily first. And then afterward, we have the spiritual. So in this life even, we have this natural body first. We have to experience the limitations, testing, trials, physical ailments first. But then guess what? The second one throughout eternity is spiritual. The lasting body that we will have forever will be a supernatural one in which we will never die. So you know what? Just to bear, bear with our limited body now, looking forward to that supernatural body forever. The first man was of the earth. Adam was made originally of the material, the, the, the dust of the ground. The second man, where is, he or, where is his origination? He's from heaven, showing his deity. As was the dust man of dust, so also those who are made of dust. That's why our bodies will go back to us. That's why we have burial, by the way. Burial is a picture of the fact that we were created out of dust. Think about that. As a body decays in the ground, naturally goes back to what? Dust, that decaying process. It also anticipates, by the way, resurrection. Um, as is a heavenly man, so are those who are, uh, who are heavenly. We'll take the nature, in one sense, of the resurrection body of Christ. As we bore the image of the man of dust, we're made in God's image, so we will bore the image of the heavenly man. We'll have a resurrected body like Christ. Now verse 50. Now I say, brethren, he's addressing believers once again, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Now again, the attack on premillennial doctrine, some would say, aren't there mortal people in the kingdom? Aren't there people in their natural bodies? Yes, there are. How in the world then can you say that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God? Not everyone will have a resurrected body. The key words inherit, not enter. Inherit may speak the, of the concept of reward, meaning that church age believers all of us will have a resurrected body. And from that group, God will reward faithful Christians in the kingdom. We'll possess it, we'll inherit it. Just like the Old Testament concept of an inheritance. Only the firstborn son had the double inheritance. This, this idea of reward. Sometimes the word inherit can refer to something every believer has, and sometimes it can refer to a special reward. I think here is the case of reward. So, we will not inherit that kingdom as far as rule in that kingdom unless we have a resurrected body. And all Christians in the church age will have that resurrected body. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery is something unrevealed in the past but now revealed. At the end of the book of Romans, Romans 16, Paul, I think it was verse 24 and 25. It may not be the exact verse, so... You go home and read your Bibles and check it out. just want to say that. Right, I'll give you the general gist of it. <laughs> a mystery is something that's hidden in the past but now revealed. We shall not all sleep. That, again, we're referring to death. But we shall all be changed. By the way, that's a, a great nursery verse. If you, We had a nursery. All the babies in the nursery will not all sleep, but we're going to all be changed. <laughs> Just in those one of the other. <laughs> but the idea here 
that uh, one day, though, Jesus will come. And that, come, that return could be imminent. There could be believers in this room, all, possibly all of us, who will be alive when Christ returns. We won't have to experience death. And that's even greater, isn't it? That hope, it's a blessed hope. This is called the rapture. It will occur in an atom of time. The word moment is atom, A-D-O-M. It means in, in the Greek days, there was the smallest indivisible unit. So in regard to time, it's just a fraction of time. Quicker than snapping your fingers. The Bible speaks of a twinkle of the eye, by the way, even quicker. Twinkling is a time that takes light to refract off the eye, bounces off the eye, boom. Quicker than you can snap your fingers, there's gonna be a change. In a moment of time, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now we have to be careful, this is not the trumpets in the book of Revelation. What's the last trump? Oh, it could be alluding to several things. By the way, there's an excellent chapter at the end of the book, Maranatha, our Lord come by round showers on this very passage of trumpets. And what he says there, several possible interpretations. The nation of Israel had several trumpets. They had a trumpet that called soldiers to gather to battle. They had a trumpet that called soldiers home after the end of the war. And that was the last trumpet. What he could be saying here that it's our time as soldiers of the cross to go home. God is blowing that last trumpet and it's time to return home. The battle is over. And so a great concept, the concept of the last trumpet. And so trumpet could also mean the end of a guard's watch as well in the Roman days. The watch is over. You know, we're watching against our adversary Satan. We're vigilant. But you know what? It's time to rest now. The watch is over. Either concept, it's great to think of that last trumpet. And by the way, there'll be trumpets in the, not the post trip like to use this too, and say, well, there's a trumpet at the end of the book of Revelation, so the, or at the end of the uh, tribulation, therefore the tribulation is post trip Well, there'll be trumpets in the millennium, and I don't know any post-millennial rapturist. So I told my seminary friend. Now, I think the idea is he's calling us home. He's calling us home. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. We shall all be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This moral must put on immortality. So when this corruptible must put on incorruption, this moral must put on immortality, then it shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? Now he's probably quoting here from the Septuagint of Hosea 13, 14. Let's look at Hosea 13, 14. But we're going to read out of the Masoretic text. And I think this is fascinating in light of the current events. Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Notice this next line. O oh, death, I will be your plagues. God is one day going to send a plague to death. And guess what? Death is going to die. <laughs> the ultimate plague that God will send is to get rid of death. <laughs> Amazing. O oh, grave, I will be your destruction. No more death. No more bodies being buried. We're looking forward to that day when one day death is eliminated. We already saw when that will occur in Revelation 21, didn't we? No more tears, no more sorrow, no more death in the eternal state. We're looking forward to the end. Remember, that's what Paul, Paul earlier spoke about. The end when finally our last enemy, death, is gone. It's destroyed. It caught the virus and died. <laughs> the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is a law. You know, death does have a sting, just like a sting of a wasp or a serpent's sting, scorpion sting. There is a hurt to death, isn't it? We experience a hurt on this earth when someone dies, even ourselves. 
There's a process of death. It's not a pleasant thing to die. But you know what? When we think about the victories of resurrection, that sting is removed. That sting is removed. The strength of sin is in the law. I mean, the law only puts a magnifier to sin. The law highlighted sin. But you know what? Christ came to have victory over law of sin. And law, by the way, the law of sin brings death. You remember Moses' law, you know, the penalty, death, 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 death. But you know what? Christ came to conquer death, didn't he? Christ came victorious over death. Look at uh, verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He paves the way for life. He is the giver of life, not only eternal life, but resurrection life. He is the one who conquered death. He arose victorious over the grave. Now that should motivate you, Christian, to serve. And that's how Paul ends. This has a practical implication in our daily living as Christians. Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast. That means keep plugging. <laughs> keep going forward. Be immovable. Don't let false teachers veer you off to the side. Say, no, I'm going to stay in this truth. The bedrock doctrine of the Christ's death and resurrection. I'm going to remain firm in it. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Be like Paul in one way. Be tireless in our service of Christ. Knowing that your labor is not to no purpose in the Lord. Think about it. Earlier it said our faith is not in vain. But you know what? Our labor is not in vain. Because of the truth of the resurrection of the Savior. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who conquered death, <coughs> who rose victorious from the grave, who now lives at the right hand of the Father, and now he will return for believers. And one day we will be transformed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and Father, as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, help us to remain steadfast in this truth, to have this confidence and faith, knowing that you are the author of life. Those of us who have believed the gospel, the good news about Christ's death and resurrection, can have this certain promise, certain hope to be with the Savior forever in a glorified body not subject to corruption. If you're watching this and you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we laid out clearly the good news that Jesus Christ died for your sins. You're guilty, but you know what? Christ took that guilt. He took that punishment. He took that penalty for you. And he rose victorious from the dead to give you life. A dead man cannot give life, but Jesus Christ conquered death. And he can give you eternal life if you simply place your faith in him. It's not about your works, your church attendance, or anything else, or anything good that you can do. He did it all. And just simply receive by faith. If you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life, if not, do so today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have right now, not when you die, now, everlasting life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.